Centre, Cloud Expo, Silicon Valley, day two. We've had a lunchtime keynote. Now we have a general session from Adaptivity. Note, the story is always different with Adaptivity. This is nothing to do with keynotes. This is a whole separate presentation, separate animations, separate everything. So please give it up for Tony Bishop, CEO of Adaptivity. Let's hear about how the cloud's transforming the enterprise. Good luck, Tony. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, I hope for all of you that um, have made it through so far that it's, uh, it's been uh, useful for you uh, and exciting. Uh, I, I think that uh, one of the things that, that I continue to see um, and be impressed with is the, uh, the pervasiveness of, of at least people thinking about cloud and thinking about cloud in the enterprise and talking about how they deal with moving from legacy <clears throat> to this target state of a cloud paradigm, and once that journey, once that maturity model, and so on. So what I, what I want to kind of cover today, and, and if you had a chance to sort of read the overview, was I, I want to pose to you uh, an approach that, that I think can help you and your organizations systematically move from getting your arms around where you're at to how can you attack those different types of cloud models that are necessary for you in, in enabling your business to go where they want to go. And, and in doing so, <clears throat> um, we've done a lot of research, having also been from the practitioner side of the industry, and, and we've sort of found that it's, it's really around structure and discipline and repeatability that becomes as essential as the enabling technology itself. And, and with that in mind, uh, I'm going to sort of take you to there's a new function that, that's just been recently announced that's part of even the ITIL environment um, in version 3 that talks about managing infrastructure around in terms of process and technology and life cycle and so on. So <clears throat> we're going to try to hit on that and sort of say what are the breakage or the, the broken linkages between it um, within using that open standard paradigm it says, how can you start to systematically mature a repeatable infrastructure engineering kind of model and, and, and life cycle management around how you go about infrastructure tied to the business, the workloads, the processes, and, and so on. So um, with that, the other thing I noticed is we're starting to start a trend with some of these videos. I mean, how many people were in here in the SAP environment before, too? And then you also had the Abiquo environment. So... We're pretty proud of the fact that, that we've got these epiphany videos, and, and I have a different one for you from this morning that just sort of sets the stage a little bit for you to, to be thinking about <clears throat> what we're going to talk about here and how hopefully it can apply to you. So you've realized that keeping your entire IT department on the same page throughout the entire life cycle of your IT infrastructure requires that you have everyone working off of one blueprint. That's great, but this IT life cycle isn't static, is it? There's always some new business demand that needs to get met. There are new technologies to implement. Systems need to be upgraded. These new events disrupt your plan and quickly create isolation and chaos. You're no longer taking care of IT demands with optimized precision. Instead, you're more of this unmanageable IT Frankenstein. Here's the thing. New events are inevitable. Maybe you want to start moving data to the cloud. Maybe you need to consolidate your own data center or perhaps optimize your portfolio of applications. Whatever the IT demands are, they require that you manage and leverage a different set of inputs and outputs around that new event, which makes your IT lifecycle alive, which is going to create chaos, unless you have a blueprint that's alive as well. You see, if you have a smart system that has all of your knowledge and standards in one place, along with your collective IT best practices and business and IT rules, then you can use it to quickly capture business inputs and intelligently interpret any new event that comes your way. And then render a new blueprint that shows the fastest and most efficient way to manage the new event across the entire life cycle. And let's face it, IT infrastructures without a living blueprint will grow out of control. Applications will break, IT costs will balloon, and you'll get chewed out. But a living blueprint adapts and continually optimizes your IT lifecycle no matter what new event comes your way. Use Adaptivity's Blueprint for IT Lifecycle Suite to create your living blueprint today.
shit. <laughs> So it's, <clears throat> it is an advertisement, you know, <clears throat> like I told you they were in the morning, we do have our VCs here, so we have to tell them that we did spend money on advertising and promotion. So, <clears throat> but outside of that, it's more around the message of the fact that there is constant change in your IT life cycle and that you need to start thinking about it. So whether you work with us or you do it on your own, of however you do it, that's what I want to pose and take you through. And, and with that, I wanted to sort of hit some opening thoughts. You guys running this clock over here too? All right. So <clears throat> the opening thoughts, the, the, the first thing that I, I wanted to hit on is that you got to start thinking about cloud in terms of enterprise IT as, as new fulfillment paradigms. Right? Keep it simple, stupid. Um, and, and think about it as new ways to deliver applications, information, communication, collaboration, and processing. That's internet connected. Second part is that cloud requires precision in your planning, your deployment and operations. So what's happening is, is the cloud's ex exacerbating it. And, and for those that were, were able to make this morning, right, the, the survey from the industry analyst, the 451 group, quoted it saying trust and control were the biggest barriers to cloud being adopted within the enterprise. So when you think about that <coughs> and you keep that as, as part of your, your paradigm and, and what you're looking at, it means then to be able to, to have trust and have control, you need to be able to start to really say, do you understand that business demand? Do you understand how that business demand tr um, you know, translates to consumption? Do you understand what that consumption has as expectations of service based on different types of business operations and day in the life of the business? And then do you understand how that's going to tie to how do I get consistent deployment and operations that meets that business demand? And if you're not doing that today in your enterprise life cycle, then the cloud's just going to expose that. So you'd be better off choking and saying, I'm going to take some discipline to it and incorporate that in. And we're going to talk a little bit about how you can do that. Third key point that, that I think is important for you all, that when you're looking at how you're going to go on your journey within moving cloud into your enterprise operating model, is precision requires discipline. And one of the big things is most of the best IT shops out there have very, very strict discipline. Usually it's a militant type IT leader that's very, very structured, very process oriented, right? Very systematic in nature. <coughs> the cloud is going to give you the ability to do new things in terms of fulfillment. But you're going to need to incorporate that kind of discipline on the front end. And that may be you know, bad medicine for certain organizations, but the reality is, is that discipline will result in positive impact. And finally, <coughs> discipline is typically not synonymous with the majority of enterprise IT operations. Right? So, so keep that in the back of your mind, depending on where you are. And I think you have to put, a, put yourself into how do, how do we as an organization operate? How is our discipline? And how is it from linking planning with the business to how I deploy and operate? And I think you've got to tie all that together. So with that, how many people have heard of ICT, Infrastructure Communications Technology, coming out of the UK government? This is now part of, called Infrastructure Management, it's now part of ITIL's version 3. So anybody in here? Do I see any hands at all? Yeah, a few. So this is probably something, a little bit of a busy slide, but let's start from the top and work our way down. Business units have business processes. Business processes invoke services. Services consume and execute on hardware or infrastructure components. Right? The supporting activity is to be able to take that environment and operate it using this now ITIL standard version 3 going forward approach to managing infrastructure. You know, incorporates activities of design and planning, all right? technical support, deployment, and operations. So what's interesting is you notice the three callouts. <laughs> the problem with ITIL and the problem with processes, they're great theoretical frameworks. But to apply a framework into a disciplined model, you need to understand what you've got to do in terms of, of the linkage. And the linkage, first of all, across the business process needs to tie to business workloads. If you don't understand your application portfolio 
and you don't understand the user demographics of who uses that and how the business views those applications, and then you don't understand how to then take and the workload that's associated with those user demographics for that portfolio and then correlate that to what data and software services is it consuming all right, and what infrastructure is it executing on, then I, I don't care if your journey's to the cloud or, or it's just going to be operating a data center, you're going to run into trouble. The second part is, <coughs> this is where if you notice the second bullet down to the right call out, the rationalizing the infrastructure portfolio, a lot of people go in and they'll turn on utilization tools and they'll say, <coughs> hmm, let's look at our utilization trend it. They'll do it for maybe a couple weeks, maybe 30 days. And then they'll go through and say, okay, I'm going to slap virtualization on, and then I'm going to turn around, and I'm going to right-size it, and I'm going to get rid of this stuff. Well, the problem why those projects fail <coughs> in meeting the needs of the business, and if you don't want to meet the needs of the business, that strategy is fine. All right? But if you actually want to change, meet the needs of the business and change the way you fulfill supporting the business, then you need to be rationalizing it from a top-down perspective that says, if I don't understand the business processes and associated workloads, and then I understand how those workloads link to various infrastructure deployment models and how they're consumed and how that operates and how that's fulfilled, then I'm not going to be able to get there. And, and so what, what I want to pose to you is I'm going to lay out for you a couple of slides of how you can do this with spreadsheets. You can do this <coughs> manually. You can document it. You can use it various tools that you have. But these are the steps that any of us that have gone through in building and deploying large-scale enterprise cloud-type environments that are secure, highly available, and highly effective, <coughs> you need to follow this kind of step. And if you don't, you're not going to realize the potential of the cloud in your environment. Step one, kind of hard to see, but across the top, <coughs> how many people in here have heard of Michael Porter, Harvard, business value chain? Okay, if you haven't, there was a question earlier this morning that said to me, one of the folks said, how do you get the IT folks to be able to be better at supporting the business? Well, you've got to understand how the business organizes itself and how it generates revenue and fulfills clients' requests right, and reports on that and tracks it. <coughs> so if you take the business value chain, in this case we use a simple capital markets, sales, trading, operations, risk, and reporting. All right, within that, there are various functions of the business or business activities. Within those business activities, if you come down the left-hand column in each row is the series of applications that support those business activities. And within that, you've got a scoring of simple low, medium, high in terms of importance to the business. So the first thing you've got to do is you've got to understand what is my application portfolio all right, and what's the associated importance to the business as I move it through. Second thing you got to do is then you got to understand the affinity. Are these applications that you're going to eventually get rid of? Because if they are, you're probably not going to want to invest in, in new fulfillment paradigms to be able to support it. <coughs> on the second part of it is, where on an affinity basis is it strategic to the business? And, you know, and, and I know that probably sounds like a little bit of a, I'm on a pulpit with a lecture, you know, sort of like the, you know, the IT priest here kind of thing, <coughs> giving you know, the religion to it. But if you don't understand where the priorities of that, of that application is and in an affinity to the importance of the business functions, then you can't change the IT fulfillment model. And if you are here investigating cloud or actually approaching and trying to implement cloud, you have to be able to change the IT fulfillment model by being able to understand the demand to then leverage the fulfillment model to attack it. And you're not going to do it for everything. Right? You're going to do it for the ones that are most important. You're going to do it for the ones that are most broken. Or you're going to do it for the ones that require the most flexibility to the way the business operates. <clears throat> Step three, shaping the demand of IT, delivery, and fulfillment. <clears throat> Qualities here are a little hard to see, but the net of it is, that did you know that there's probably somewhere in the case of 50 to 60 workload qualities <clears throat> for any application workload? out there today, <clears throat> 50 to 60. How many people in here have profiled every one of the applications that they support and have captured down the granularity of 50 to 60 workload qualities? Anybody? How many people in here typically profile workload quality by the number of CPUs, how much memory, maybe how much disk, right, kind of thing? Hands up. 
How many of that? So a larger percentage defines workload by the actual infrastructure resource, not around how the workload executes in terms of you know, the type of data, the type of movement with the data, the concurrency effect, all right, or the parallelization effect of multiple tasks happening at the same time, or concurrency where I have multiple users asking for the same thing, the marshalling of data, the state of where that data is, the processing of it, what nodes do I want it to process on to have what types of attributes, that's the kind of discipline, folks, that you have to get to and understand. And the beauty is there's tools here today that you can go to in the Cloud Expo organization that, you know, or out to the hall, I mean, that you can actually look at that have the ability to show you from a metering and an instrumentation and a performance standpoint that can tell you pretty well what they are. But you've got to do the homework to go get the data out of it, and then you've got to say, what am I going to do with it to understand it? And then once I understand it, how do I tie it back to what the applications are that the business said that they cared about? <clears throat> Step four, you need to rationalize the software stacks. How many people are in here are doing standard Windows, Linux, you know, t- Unix types software stacks? Anybody in here, you know, are you basing things like on... Uh, Red Hat, are you basing things on, you know, in JBoss, are you basing things on Oracle in their environments? Is that a yes? Do I have some yeses in here? Everybody's asleep from the lunch. Is it really killing you guys? <clears throat> so, you can't rationalize the software stacks in a vacuum. Most platform engineering operations in enterprise IT today are guessing at what they're trying to do. So they're taking and saying, well, I'm going to standardize it for the best way that I do you know, uh, you know, an OLTP system, the best way I do a data warehouse, the best way I do some basic types of approaches. But they're doing it without understanding the workloads. They're doing it without understanding the priority of the applications and which ones they're targeting those next generation stacks for. So you have to be able to get that to the point where you're defining, again, the business demand is workloads, the affinity of those applications that are executing those workloads, and those workloads ties now to the software infrastructure all the way up to the application container and data framework and so on, or client side, that ties it all together. Then, <laughs> only then, if you lay it out, is then you've got to lay a roadmap of where am I at to where I'm going to go. How many people in here are in enterprises today where you have hundreds to thousands of combinations of stack builds in your operation? Hands up. So there is at least, I could see about a dozen hands, if not more. <clears throat> and in most organizations, if you were to poll most CTOs today, the number one problem of complexity is the fact that they've got thousands of combinations, hundreds to thousands, and in a lot of cases thousands of combinations of different platform combinations with no sense, sense or rhyme or reason to why I have these combinations And it creates this complexity barrier for me to be able to deploy new technologies or to be able to deploy in a cycle time and manner that allows me to realize what it is that I'm trying to do. So this is the way that, think about this. All you're really doing is you're breaking down very good IT discipline that if you're able to actually break that down and rationalize it from the workload and the affinity down and then rationalize your stacks, you're going to drive simplicity And then you're going to be able to go, well, now that I have the simplicity, I can really start to operationalize a new fulfillment paradigm. This cloud model becomes a lot easier because then from a security standpoint, I understand what everything's running in. Now, whether I run that inside or outside my organization, you know, that's a choice. What type of combinations of hardware infrastructure I run on is probably important. But at least I have the ability now to get to that. Step five, deployment configuration prep. (coughs) You can't go to a cloud, and this is probably a controversial point. <clears throat> so I'm going to pause here and, and state it and restate it again. If you believe that by throwing virtualization on that you do not need to care about the infrastructure that's underneath in terms of qualities and attributes, then you are going to fail at cloud outside of general purpose basic computing. So let me restate that again. <clears throat> If you are trying to build cloud for the enterprise and you go down a design approach path that you believe that if I just throw virtualization on, I don't need to worry about the infrastructure underneath <coughs> and it should just be, you know, should be vanilla and should be generic in nature, you're going to fail at the adoption of cloud computing in the enterprise. Now, how many people in here disagree with me? You're allowed. It's a free country. You have your right to be wrong. 
Anybody? It's quiet. This is really bad, guys. <clears throat> so the reason for it is, is this is where the adoption, you want to understand the biggest thing you need to be able to do in being able to drive adoption of cloud computing is you need to be able to understand that business is not vanilla. All right? Business does not execute in a very simple standard way. Business has fluctuations. Business is unpredictable. Business is ad hoc. Business is on demand, right? Business is at a point where things are changing, regulatory-based, economic-based, right? Consumer behavior-based, depending on the organization. So you have to be able to marry, and this is a good one for when the Intel presentation is on that you guys should really pay attention to when, when Billy Cox comes on and, and covers this, because if you do not have security and trust and you do not have the right type of computing footprint married to the right combination of software stack, married to the right combination of workload, supporting the right types of application environment, you're going to end up in a point where you're going to not deliver on what the business expects. In a lot of cases, that's where then you have these organizations that entrench themselves in this server-hugging kind of paradigm that says, well, at least if I know it's on the box the way it is, I know what I'm going to get. So if you want to break that barrier, what you've got to be able to do is you've got to become a good student at understanding what that demand model is and how you correlate that to the supply model and then how you build that into a repeatable deployment, configuration deployment, and implementation standpoint. Step six. <clears throat> so once you get the configuration figured out, you've got to leverage these different types of infrastructure footprints. You know, one of the things that for the service providers in the room, I would state to you that if you want to win the Amazons, the Terramarks, Savas, you name it, any of them, <laughs> if you really want to win enterprise computing where there's mass consumption of infrastructure, then, then you, I would pose to you that the way to approach CTOs you know, and CIOs is I can give you all right, exactly the kind of quality you're looking for in a dynamic, virtual, tear up, tear down, you know, split it whatever way you want kind of environment. And I can do it to the specific qualities of the workloads you're running. They're going to be the people that get the best shots for the mass amounts of it, not the organizations that just say, well, yeah, I have a virtual environment, I have a virtual server, I have virtual memory and virtual computer, and I'm good to go. Step seven. <clears throat> you need to integrate this into a targeted living state. Your environment will not <clears throat> you know, be static in nature. It will be not static in the adoption of technologies. There will constantly be innovation of the way, better ways to manage, better ways to monitor, better ways to provision, so on. And what you've got to do is you've got to break that down into a capability framework and capability paradigm that allows you to be able to take and say, how do I continue to refine the way that I manage the delivery of IT as new technologies and new fulfillment capabilities come to bear? So in doing so, what we've laid out is you have to constantly understand that demand model in the business units as they shape and adjust and bring up new products and, and get rid of new products in the evolution of their business cycle. You need to be able to change the way that you start to organize and plan. You need to be able to change the way that you architect. You need to be able to change the way that you engineer. And finally, you need to be able to change the way that you manage. So that's your continuum of a life cycle. And what you need to be able to do is start to constantly target it at, is this going to be a model where I use the arbitrage of a variable capacity to reduce some of my costs and, and let minimize over-provisioning of peak? Am I going to end up moving to models where, you know what, we're not going to be in the business of building CRM systems, so I'm going to go with best of breed. I'm going to go with salesforce.com, and I'm going to let them continue to do the R&D innovation of it. And what I'm going to do is make sure that I can manage and orchestrate that service as needed and understand how I can fulfill my users. <coughs> you know, a third one's going to be, am I going to build applications or am I going to buy applications? And in either case, whether I build or I buy, how am I going to tie that together into a consistent platform delivery model, which means that I need to build out my own platform as a service capability. All of those things need to come together on the multiple dimensions and understand your fulfillment strategy. So let's go back to what I said at the beginning. It's a fulfillment strategy change that allows you that if you incorporate the discipline of how you look at what the demand is, how you look at your supply, and then how you look at your fulfillment model, you're going to be able to continually drive cloud change into the environment. Discipline is always a boring topic. You know, I noticed that when I was a kid when I was younger. <laughs> right? I was like one of those kids that just loved to, 
you know, you know, just not be, uh, you know, not have to adhere to anything, any structure, any discipline with it. And I'll tell you what got me was <clears throat> what ended up getting me was the change came was when I started playing hockey and went through on a scholarship into playing hockey in Canada. And and the biggest thing that the, the coach said to me was he said, <clears throat> those that are disciplined and those that work harder than anybody else will always be more successful in life than anything else, no matter what it is that they do. And, and it was funny, you know, we won, you know, what would be your NCAA, you know, uh, championships two out of four years that I was there. And, and, and that stuck with me. And how funny as I move into this, you know, this information technology world, it's a principle that I got to tell you is, is even more so. And having ran, you know, uh, you know a 50,000 node infrastructure globally across 16 data centers, I can tell you that discipline is the key to the whole thing. And how you go about planning, designing, implementing, and managing your infrastructure is going to be the key of where you can go with cloud. So, how can you get there? You can get there, and the way that we show you in the world is so that you can go after the legacy and fixing it on a capability basis. Think of them like building blocks, optimizing data centers, implementing virtualization, implementing provisioning and orchestration and so on, and monitoring and metering. And then you can start to say, anything net new, I'm going to start to build. So every time a new service request comes in, I'm going to have my reference architectures and my engineering best practices, and I'm going to codify them. I'm going to have, like in the case of what Intel's done with their Open Data Center Alliance and their Cloud Builders program, I'm going to take my, my vendor's best practices and I'm going to apply them also in a repeatable, intelligent decision support way and build that into a process that says the way that I go about planning, designing, deploying, and operating will pull it all together. This is how you get cloud pervasively adopted across your enterprise. This is how you get cloud to be able to take you to that next level of fulfillment paradigm. So, some parting thoughts, and then open for some questions and Q&A. Cloud exacerbates the need for system planning and management discipline. I think I pounded that point home. Planning needs to link demand with architecture, engineering, and ops. If you are in one of those functions and you're not parallel working with the other functions, then you're not going to be able to get it to where the optimal state is. <clears throat> Your strategic systems and management vendors should help you standardize and apply best practices and a repeatable decision support model for your cloud journey. If you're not making your vendors come in and say, give me your best practice, show me how I can repeatably apply that and link that to my other components in my strategy, then, then that's something you need to start doing immediately. And finally, in our case, whether you use ours or you take that kind of approach of a blueprint, the blueprint can help you control that change across that journey. So with that, that's what I wanted to cover for the afternoon and open it up for questions. And here we come. Let's see who is going to launch the first question, because this is a good chance. He's here. The questions are always coming from the left-hand side, so I'm obviously not looking at the right-hand side enough. Right-hand people. Ah, that'll be why. That makes it a lot easier. Hmm. There. What do you say about pre-configured cloud system infrastructure, things that have been done for you, like what Rackspace is doing, doing with their cloud hosting products, which I am a client of. Yep. I think for, <clears throat> um, depending on the types of application, the workloads that you're running, um, I would say that in that manner, that is an excellent um, fundamental discipline and starting point. I think the pre-configured configurations allow you to be able to, to start to improve that cycle of deployment time. Um, I would state to you that even Rackspace and the others need to start to look at that there's different types of workloads and there's different types of application patterns that you need to support and fulfillment models, and they need to be able to say, how can I tailor those configurations to those different types of workloads? But I think that that's absolutely, from a distance standpoint, that is a good example of the start at one of the starting building blocks that you can do. Tony, you're right about that lunch thing. <laughs> Thanks for that. That was very helpful. Um, what's the average time scale if you were looking at one of those organizations with the thousand variant model? How, how, how long does the journey take? <clears throat> um, uh, excellent question. I think it's as good as the, um, 
is the organizational management has in place. Um, if you use automation to be able to gather data, one of the tricks that we've seen is, is being able to say, you know, if you have like a inventory and dependency discovery mapping type tools that can tell you about what exists, and then you can simply go through a, a pretty rapid, you know, tell me about, tell me about, tell me about kind of functions. Um, you can probably get there in a, you know, a, a 45 to 90 day cycle um, for where you can get into the thousands kind of concept. And, and from that, give you the ability to start to really have, you know, think about it. If you have that map for everything, you have the, a much, much more powerful insight to be able to go, this is what I want to attack. And it helps the business understand, oh, yeah, I forgot I have all those things. Does that make sense? Question number three, come along. I'm still looking over here. Tony, it's no good. You've worn them out. <laughs> we may Great. as well face it. Let's say thank you then, please. Thank to you. Tony Bishop. <laughs> <laughs>